Welcome to the first episode in a two-part Legendarium series about Paracelsus, the Rebel Alchemist. In part one, we will talk about the early life and education of the man who challenged conventional thinking in late medieval Europe. Paracelsus, known as Theophrastus as a boy, was born in the Swiss village of Einsiedel. He was the offspring of a mixed-class marriage between the illegitimate son of a knightly family, who had become an impoverished doctor and chemist, and the bondservant of a nearby cloister. His mother's status rendered Paracelsus a semi-serf. Even at his death, his belongings became subject to claims by the local church authorities who once owned his mother's labor. Sadly, his mother died when Paracelsus was only nine years old, and his father shortly thereafter moved to Villach, a town located in southern Austria. By watching his father give medical advice and comfort to visiting pilgrims, the young Paracelsus developed a desire to follow in his father's footsteps. His father, named Wilhelm, urged Paracelsus to study Latin and medicine. Paracelsus also attended the Bergschule, an academy founded by the wealthy Fugger family of Augsburg, where his father once taught chemical theory. Youngsters trained at the Bergschule became overseers and analysts for mining operations owned by the Fugger family in gold, tin, and mercury, along with iron and copper sulfate ores. The young Paracelsus learned the prevailing scientific theories of his day at Bergschule. They included the belief that metals supposedly grew in the earth and ascribed magical powers to various animals. For example, thinkers at the time believed that wild bears could create healing potions out of honey and dead bees. Wilhelm gave his son Paracelsus herbs, stones, water, and metals to study, which initiated him into the wonders of nature. Paracelsus also watched the transformations of metallic constituents in smelting vats and learned about the centuries-long dream of transmuting base metals like lead into gold. Those experiences gave Paracelsus a keen understanding of metallurgy and chemistry. This in turn likely laid the foundations of his later discoveries in the field of chemotherapy. However, his lowly class origins also affected his thinking, making him a fearless iconoclast who did not hesitate to challenge the ruling class or calcified theories. For a personal motto, he tellingly adopted the Latin phrase alterius non sit qui sus esse potest, which translates as let him not belong to another who is able to possess himself. Young Paracelsus came of age at a time when the ancient science of alchemy still profoundly shaped European thought. It dated back 2,000 years to Ptolemaic Egypt. Egyptian thinkers believed they could make gold out of base metals, and during the Christian era, thinkers came to see gold as a perfect, godly metal. And if they could create the philosopher's stone, said to be a dark and glassy substance, red or blue color, it would make all things perfect. That meant a touch of the philosopher's stone would transmute lead into gold, the perfect metal, and restore the innocence and immortality of Adam and Eve to men and women. In short, it was both a scientific and a spiritual quest. Though the medieval church regarded alchemy with ambivalence and even hostility at times, it thrived among Europe's educated classes. Fortunately, Paracelsus came of age during the Renaissance, when the literate classes openly gloried in human striving and challenged the all-powerful church. Truth would not be found in churches, but schools for this new generation. In 1507, Paracelsus joined the many wandering youths who traveled throughout Europe during the late Middle Ages. Such students sought out the most famous teachers at one university after another. Over the course of five years, Paracelsus is said to have attended the universities of Basel, Vienna, Wittenberg, Leipzig, and Cologne. 
However, he became disappointed with each one. In a typical jibe, he wondered how the high colleges managed to produce so many high donkeys. His disappointments may have stemmed from his challenges to traditional attitudes. He wrote, The universities do not teach all things, so a doctor must seek out old wives, gypsies, sorcerers, wandering tribes, old robbers, and such outlaws, and take lessons from them. A doctor must be a traveler, for knowledge is experience. In his time, medicine remained based on the four humors, which held that four bodily fluids must be kept in harmony. With a few contemporaries, the student Paracelsus began to realize this theory's many shortcomings in treating illnesses. Paracelsus graduated from the University of Vienna with a baccalaureate in medicine during the year 1510. He then went to the University of Ferrara in Italy, where he found extraordinary academic freedom and rejected the prevailing view that the stars and planets controlled all the parts of the human body. He argued that doctors must concern themselves with the practical business of treating illness. He received a doctoral degree from the University of Ferrara in 1516. There he began to use the name Paracelsus for the first time. This translated to above Celsus and reflected his belief that he had exceeded the renowned first century Roman writer, Aulus Cornelius Celsus. Such a claim shocked and scandalized the academic community of Europe. Indeed, Paracelsus soon fled Ferrara to avoid charges of necromancy or communing with the dead for evil purposes. Soon after, he served in the so-called Netherlandish Wars as an army surgeon with the mercenary forces that fought Europe's wars. In 1521, he again served with an army in Italy. Though he claimed to have served in Russia and Hungary as well, these claims are not known for certain. Yet everywhere he went, he sought out the most learned practitioners of practical alchemy. Paracelsus wished not only to discover the most effective means of medical treatment, but also to learn more of natural forces. These included magic, which Paracelsus believed that God created, but evil magicians and necromancers misused. He later wrote... He who is born in imagination discovers the latent forces of nature. Besides the stars that are established, there is yet another imagination that begets a new star and a new heaven. And we will find out what Paracelsus did with his knowledge in the second episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.